So I had begun a research project on the history of data mining. And I had what I thought was going to be a clever idea. And I'm hoping it will come up. <laughs> but if not, I'll just pause. So I, I had a clever idea, which was I thought, if I want to study the history of data mining, why not take the tools of the data miners and use them on themselves? That is, to data mine data mining or a notation that will be more available to you. I would data mine, <laughs> data mine. And I was very happy with myself until I discovered something uh, on a web archive. Oops, it's too fast. An agency which I'd never heard of before, the Advanced Research and Development Activity Agency, a research wing of the National Security Agency, around 2000 had undertaken a project called Novel Intelligence for Massive Data. It was at once a research project into cutting-edge data mining, but it was simultaneously a project to mine the miners, to understand analysts themselves, and a part of the project called glass box analysis, in which white people from the 80s would be supervised, and they would be studied for how they do analysis. In other words, I found myself in the position of data mining, people who are data mining, data mining. Or again, in notation, you know. Now, what's interesting here is that by 2000, which I know to you may seem a year and a day ago, or much longer than that, it had become so important to one of the most secretive agencies in the world that they ought to push data mining, both of vast data sets and of people, that it made it a major project. Now, my project was precisely about the history of this effort. Now, data mining is an old pejorative term for bad statistical work, and it got turned around in the course of the 90s and the early 2000s. It was known by a variety of names. It became, in some sense, legitimized with the name Knowledge Discovery and Databases, which now seems deeply old-fashioned, but for reasons I'm going to talk about, I think, is actually really useful. It's now often analytics, data science, big, big data. I'm not even sure what the next one will be. Now, to understand the emergence of data science comes from, it is to understand a, a critique of several disciplines of themselves. For example, in a 1991 manifesto, some scientists reflected that scientists can reformulate and rerun their experiments should they find the initial design was inadequate. Database managers rarely have the luxury of redesigning their data fields and recollecting their data. The argument was that not to alter our criteria in organizing our disciplines for the analysis of arrays of vast data is to deny ourselves the kinds of things we potentially could know. And it was to indulge in a luxury we do not have. It was a challenge, in other words, to what were some of the values of different academic communities, machine learning, academic statistics, database practitioners, and indeed, people in the intelligence community. Now, data mining had been pejorative in 1972. It was denounced in an article called Alchemy and the Behavioral Sciences. But now it was becoming the, ground, the name for a new movement. One of the, the founders of this movement, a man named Ross Quinlan, who came out of machine learning, explained that data mining is an offspring of three disciplines, database statistics and the machine learning subfield of artificial intelligence. And indeed, if one begins to look at the field, that is precisely true. To understand what is called data mining in textbooks or in classes is to see a series of algorithms and practices that emerge in database studies, in machine learning, and in statistics itself. But what matters to these various disciplines? Well, I thought, let us try some of these things. Indeed, let's do some unsupervised learning, as the machine learning people call it. 
And so I began looking at the journals as they existed in the middle of the 90s when this movement began to picking up steam. In the journal, of, for example, of database analysis, you found that the concerns were cost, information, database, query, but memory and performance. A concern was scale. In machine learning, it was quite otherwise. The concern was algorithms, learning, bias, not scale. The history I was beginning to tell was about how to bridge these two things, what was gained and what was lost. From machine learning came an important notion, an important sense that something hadn't gone right in artificial intelligence, something hadn't gone right in expert, knowledge, in, in expert systems. It was called the knowledge acquisition bottleneck. The idea was that when you asked experts about their knowledge, they weren't very good in telling you. So instead of doing that, one ought to come with, with methods that would understand quantitatively why they do the kind of classifying they do. And from the database community came an insistence on what it meant to do things at scale. So in a paper that's perhaps of minor significance, but it captures exactly what was significant here, the authors complain that approaches in machine language and statistics do not adequately consider the case that the data set can be too, can be too large to fit in main memory. Now, mathematically, this may not be that fascinating, but it was of tremendous importance in rethinking about how an algorithm could be devised such that even the dist distance metrics it's using could do things with low I.O. costs. It is this combination of resources that was coming together around 2000 that gained the interest of the National, uh, the, 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 the National Security Agency, who thought that they ought to fund this, and indeed to data mine data mining. Now, I, came, I, I wanted to do this project, and I wanted to understand not just an intellectual history, of these various algorithms. That I knew I could do, and that I, can, I am doing. But what kind of tools could I use? What would be the tools that would be useful for studying this development and the success of data miners themselves? How could I get beyond simply full text analysis of a one journal run, but understand how people felt and, and, and argued about algorithms and why some came to have success? It was to treat classic problems in the history of science and technology from a new way. I also wanted, just like the people in the intelligence world, to understand something about what is called the tacit knowledge of data analysts. That is, all the things that don't really fit in the textbook, that you only learn on the job. How could I get at that in some way? The traditional way to do this had been to talk to people, to do ethnographic study, but could I learn to scale it? Well, that's what I'm up to right now. And to come back to my circa 1990 graphics, I'm building a database that's going to allow me to do this. And what I need to do this is a suite of technologies to automatically extract evidence from vast amounts of unstructured textual data and then discover relationships among those extracted facts. These technologies exist in profusion and at the heart of a movement of the digital humanities. But in doing my history, I couldn't be unconscious of where they came from. And indeed, my quotation comes from another government project from exactly the same moment, a, a large project called Evidence, discovery, Evidence Extraction and Linked Discovery, whose objective was precisely to look at unstructured data and to provide links between them in an automatic way. Not from my perspective of studying data mining, but to provide, quote, advance warning of potential terrorist activities. This research project from DARPA has been enormously productive in driving these fields. I don't know how productive it's been in the world of terrorism, but it's been enormously productive, and it's the heart of many of the tools in the new forms of the digital humanities, though few people are aware of this. It was part of the ill-fated effort called Total Information Awareness, which, in a massive lack of irony, included this symbol with an eye looking upon the world. It was rapidly closed in public view, and moved into the shadowy world of the spooks. But it still existed, and many of the tools that were important for it existed. So I found myself in this peculiar state, 
a state that was at once lovely to my conflicted postmodernist slash recursive mathematician self that I was, oops, I was data mining, data mining, data mining, data mining. That is a fourfold recursion. Now, the thing that really surprised me when I began looking at this government effort, which I had remembered, is that it was deeply conscious that this was not, that data mining wasn't going to be something that simply looked at large amounts of data, but it was to be a social project of many people looking at large amounts of data. It was a project that was deeply conscious of groups of an analyst working together. It was a project that was worried about how could the government optimize collaboration among analysts. And it made me think of what I thought of what some of the best work in data mining at the end of the last century. A computational statistician, Peter Huber, wrote that data mining is not one of replacing human ingenuity by machine intelligence, but rather assisting human ingenuity by all conceivable tools to do what he called an improvisation of search tools that would keep track of the progress of an analysis. It is there, a human-centered form of data analysis, that seemed to me the most rich way to understand the, the, these remarkable tools that have now infused our lives. And the way that would help me think ahead to what it meant about some of the richest analytical tools we have being heavily funded by the, by, 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 by the government and yet potentially profoundly liberatory. Thank you.